Hello everyone, I am uh, Ambli Shivdas. I work as a D Welcome DBT Early Career Fellow at uh, the Division of Nutrition at St. John's Research Institute. Uh, in today's uh, video lecture, I will be talking about implementing pharmacogenetics in the clinic and some of the main topics that we will be uh, to discussing today in this regard are uh, some of the key considerations for implementing pharmacogenetics in the clinic and where we'll actually go through some of the resources that are important for understanding this and also we will touch upon clinical pharmacogenomics testing and how one can go from the genetic results to uh, the pharmacogenetic reports that can then be uh, incorporated into your clinical decision, uh, decision support systems and uh, we also will discuss uh, some of the ongoing uh, pharmacogenetics implementation studies that are out there and thereby uh, talk about some of the barriers that are faced and some of the solutions that are out there. Now going forward, one of the biggest motivations for uh, implementing pharmacogenetics in the clinic uh, stems from the mounting evidence uh, that shows that the traditionally practiced uh, one-size-fits-all model uh, leads to a spectrum of responses in the patients ranging from those who have a high level of toxicity uh, with very minimal efficacy to those individuals who are suboptimal responders and finally the ones who adequate resp uh, ad who respond adequately uh, given the scenario uh, you know there is a lot of research that actually hints at uh, how genetic factors uh, which influence a uh, majority of these kind of response can be used to tailor the prescriptions to each individual. So under this context, we have uh, the, something called the pharmacogenetics guided model where genetic tests can be used to understand an individual's genetic profile, pharmacogenetic profile and which can be used to now tailor the right dose of the right drug to each patient thereby maximizing efficacy and minimizing toxicity. Now uh, for, for this kind of a framework we need some very important elements and one of the strongest elements is to have a very strong scientific evidence base. This is very important in terms of understanding which are the major drugs that needs to be prioritized for implementing uh, pharmacogenetics in the clinic. Also important is the availability of testing, genetic testing for the genes that are relevant in those contexts. And uh, uh, I should also say that one of the most important factors is also to have clinical guide guidelines that can now help a clinician to go from the genetic results all the way to the clinical action, the specific clinical action. Apart from this, we also need a very robust and continually updated uh, reporting system which uh, can also be used by the patient not just for his present diagnosis and prescriptions but also in future. And then in the end, it's also very important to have, have a strong education system around this that can, or, that can inform all the stakeholders in this effort like the clinicians, the patients, the pharmacists, everyone to be able to move with the ongoing research that happens in this domain. Now uh, about the evidence base, there are some really important resources that can now help you understand the key, the, the major pharmacogenetic findings. So if you just go back in the history of pharmacogenetics, it was probably back in 510, 510 BC, Pythagoras who was the first one to actually talk for the first time about differential response among individuals to fava beans. And then after so many centuries, it was in 1959 that the term pharmacogenetics got coined by the scientist Vogel. And after that, across more than 50 years of research has led to an increase in scientific evidence and publications in this area and it was in 2002 for the first time that a central uh, knowledge base was created in the name of farm GKB, uh, farm pharmacogenomics knowledge base uh, which is an NIH funded resource and this was created to provide information about how the different genetic variations can affect response to medications. They manually collect, curate uh, the pharmacogenomics literature that is out there and uh, all the extracted knowledge is presented in, the, in an online website uh, database for the end user to uh, read and understand. And apart from the uh, basic the variant drug 
pairs in for different uh, drugs that are concerned they also curate the different clinical in, in interpretation that is how we can go from the genotype to the phenotype and how can it can also be implemented in terms of a dosing guideline and finally incorporated into your clinical decision support system in the form of alert text now uh, as of uh, october 7 2022 there are there's a lot of information that is out there curated for uh, more than 884 drugs uh, different uh, drug centered pathway information has been curated a set of very important pharmaco genes has been identified for which very detailed summaries have been provided that's for about 68 vips and detailed variant annotations are provided along with the drug gene uh, uh, drug gene annotations which are nothing but the clinical annotations so all this information are going to allow one to now understand which are the drugs for which the known the most high evidence uh, associations have been found and what kind of action can be uh, taken for these drugs to just take you through one of some of the key uh, elements of this knowledge base uh, one is as i said drug label annotation so what you can find in these uh, uh, drug label annotation table are a listing of all the drugs and the drug label uh, annotations provided by the different drug regulatory agencies across the world like the US Food and Drug Administration FDA European Medicines Agency the Swiss Agency of Therapeutic Projects Swiss Medic uh, PMDA in Japan and Health Canada so different uh, drug regulatory agencies across the world have i have uh, inserted uh, comments and indications in the drug labels related to pharmacogenetic uh, testing and the need for pharmacogenetic testing so as you can see there are certain drugs like for example abrocitinib in here which has an actionable pharmacogenetic uh, finding that's right there in for in terms of dosing the drug and you will also uh, appreciate how these kind of uh, uh, messages or information varies across the different agencies that are across the world and all these are brought together under one umbrella in this knowledge base uh, now going forward, uh, this is the specific table that's very useful when it comes to understanding uh, which drugs have uh, have pharmacogenetic information in the drug labels as per the US FDA. This is the table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in drug labeling and this is one resource which, which is very helpful and which is also continuously updated and therefore needs revisiting. And then uh, we also have farm GKB pathways, as I said, for each drug, the carefully curated uh, genetic pathways that are associated with the absorption, the metabolism, the distribution and excretion of the drug are carefully illustrated and uh, shared in this, uh, uh, in this table here. Also, drug level, at the, at the level of each drug, a lot of variety of information has been compiled together. Uh, in terms of uh, the different clinical annotations as well as the pathways. For example, here for clopidogrel, which is an antiplatelet drug, we know that there are about 11 prescribing info that is there in this database, five drug label annotations across the different agencies, 49 clinical annotations, which means 49 drug gene pairs that has been identified to be associated with the response to this drug and two pathways that has been curated as well. Uh, and uh, as I said, the clinical annotations table looks something like this, where for every drug and a gene, you have a detailed annotation. So for in this case, clopidogrel and the gene CYP2C19, which is one of the primary metabolizer for this uh, drug, you can see that there is a level 1A evidence annotation that is there which tells you that certain variants in this gene can affect the efficacy or toxicity of this drug right so now uh, at this point i would like you to appreciate the different levels of evidence that are listed here as i said uh, there are four uh, major levels of evidence uh, that has been assigned to the different annotations in the farm jkb database and it ranges from you know level four which has unsupported uh, a level of evidence to all the way to level one, which has very high level of reproducible evidence suggesting that there is a strong influence of the gene on the response of that drug. 
so typically the level 1 and uh, uh, level 1 clinical annotations are already implemented in some known clinical guideline and the level 2 ones are the ones that are variants in a very known pharmaco pharm gkb very important pharmacogy so these are usually considered as the most important drug gene pairs that you want to focus on uh, so as i said Uh, the clinical guideline annotations that is the next uh, main information most important key information that is outlined in the pharm jkb database now a clinical guideline annotation is nothing but an a, a guideline that tells you how to modify your prescription for that particular drug in the light of the genetic uh, or the phenotype that an individual has based on the genetic profile of an individual so again there are multiple uh consortia that across the world that are made of scientists and researchers in this field who come together and issue these guidelines that make it very easy for a clinician to now act upon the genetic data of a patient uh so cpic which is clinical pharmacogenetics implementation consortium is one of the strong uh, uh drug dosing guideline issuing authority in the space um and uh, so this is a table where for different drugs the number of guidelines that are out there has been compiled together so as i said the guideline annotations help you translate the genetic information to clinical information and the different uh, consortia uh, that are out there like the cpic the, there's the dutch pharmacogenetics working group there's a canadian uh, pharmacogenomics network for drug safety group as well as several other uh, uh, groups across the world and all these guidelines are uh, compiled together in the single window and uh, to ask if, how does a typical guideline look like this is an example where again for uh, clopidogrel cyptoc19 gene this is the uh, dosing guideline that you can see here so as you can see on your left hand side the first column basically tells you what is a, what is the corresponding phenotype if you are a cyptoc19 ultra rapid metabolizer or if you are an intermediate metabolizer of that particular gene then what does that mean for you to uh, uh, take a particular drug like clopidogrel which is metabolized by the cyptoc19 gene which is a phase 1 uh, metabolizing enzyme so as you can see here you can uh, for the in intermediate and poor metabolizers you can see that when you look at the therapeutic recommendation the highlighted Uh, uh, uh highlighted cells here you can see that how they have they have to be recommended to avoid the standard dose clopidogrel and be replaced with another uh, therapeutic option such as prasugrel or tisagrel or at standard dose if no contraindication so this was also supported by a very strong uh, evidence and that's why it's been classified as a one with strong classification of recommendation um now so to just to summarize some of the main resources that we have now gone through uh, we have the farm gkb which compiles all the um, all the pharmacogenetics related, genetics related annotations uh, in the in this particular domain you have the fda table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in drug labeling which gives you a direct information of which are the drugs for which the pharmacogenetic information has been indicated in their drug labels and also cpic among other consortia which are actively issuing genotype guidance uh, pre prescription guidelines for different drugs based on the evidence that are emerging now you might now ask okay as a clinician now which are the drug gene pairs that i should first select to go and implement it in the clinic right Uh, now there are different factors that are important uh, to be able to decide something like this one is of course the clinical impact of the negative outcome is that a significant enough clinical impact that you would want to act upon immediately another obviously very important point is that there should be enough scientific evidence for this particular drug gene effect so you definitely want to select ones which is in the level 1 of the farm gkb annotations now is there a population specific prevalence of this variant now if you are working in a certain working in a certain population what is the prevalence of this genetic variation in your population is that high enough or is it too rare that it's almost non existent in your population that would be a very important consideration for making this decision 
And the next important thing is, is genetic testing available for the drug? Are you going to be able to identify the patient who needs this, uh, this recommendation? So is there a testing option that is available? And most importantly, is there an alternate therapy available after? Uh, that's also a very important consideration. So make it, keeping all these consideration, you will be able to arrive at the set of drug gene pairs that can be uh, prioritized for implementation in your clinic. Now, uh, now if you look at, for, to just continue in this same line of thought, now if I were to look at all the level A actionable pharmacogenetic drug gene pairs listed by the CPIC consortia, by level A, I mean the genetic information should be used to change prescribing of the affected drug. That's what the level A annotation indicates as per CPIC. So if I now take out all the drug gene pairs that are annotated with level A uh, evidence in CPIC as well as considered actionable, I get about uh, this is a table that basically summarizes the, the genes and the therapeutic areas across which these genes and the associated drugs uh, are uh, for, are belonging to. So as you can see, for some genes such as, let's say, the, the typical uh, metabolizing enzymes like the CYP2C19 or the CYP2C9, you can see that how the testing of the gene can actually help prescription in not just one therapeutic area, but more than one therapeutic areas. So this is the last column here tells you the number of drugs for which you can modify the uh, prescription based on the testing of this one single gene. Right. For example, G6PD, you have about 13 drugs across multiple therapeutic areas that can be um, uh, that can be uh, changed or acted upon. Uh, so, as I said, this basically summarizes the information of 14 genes and 45 drugs that are listed here down, which are considered the most actionable at this point of time as I'm speaking. All right. So now the very important to appreciate in this context is like I said, the ethnic variability of these different uh, phenotypes uh, that we speak about. So in terms of clopidogrel and CYP2C19 phenotypes like the poor metabolizer, the intermediate metabolizer, the extensive metabolizer and the ultra rapid metabolizer, if you just go across the world from one side to the other, you can see how, how starkly the distribution of these phenotypes change. If, if you just look at the red one, red color here, which is the poor metabolizer, the share of poor metabolizers in the population, you can see how it increases substantially as you go from the Americas all the way to the East Asian populations. So therefore, it's very important to keep this in your context to be able to do population specific studies to understand the prevalence of these pharmacogenetic variants and that would be very that would be an important factor in deciding which drug gene pairs you want to implement in the clinic uh, and then now moving on to pharmacogenetic testing so as far as ge genetic testing in pharmacogenetics is concerned there are two ways you go about it one is reactive testing and the other one is preemptive testing so reactive as the name suggests is when you have a patient who has been taking a drug and they're just not getting the uh, reaching the expected or the, uh, the expected efficacy or they have a different kind of side effects to the drug and now you suspect that there is probably something that is in the genetic profile of this individual that is preventing from this individual to get the required benefit and in that case you go ahead and order a genetic test and then you decide to change uh, or to continue the medication based on the results. So that's reactive testing. Reactive testing is good. You, uh, it's a focused approach, but at the same time, uh, it, it also is not cost effective when it comes to, you know, understanding the entire pharmacogenetic profile. If you go gene by gene, of course, that would cost much more than being able to test a set of genes together as in case of preemptive testing where a person like, like for example the 14 genes that I spoke about in the previous slide if you could get tested for all these 14 genes in one go uh, and then if you could be alerted every time you are now about to uh, take or to be prescribed a drug that whether you are going to be a good responder for that drug that would be really informative for you it would also save you a lot of uh, money as well as uh, effort in terms of getting the right treatment in all your future investigations as well. 
Now, another important factor in the genetic testing is that nowadays we have different ways. You have direct to consumer testing options available where commercial companies offer a different kind of genetic test to you. Or it could also be a healthcare provider mediated or a clinic based one. Uh, usually uh, organizations, agencies like FDA warn against using direct to consumer testing because there's a lot of variation between the reporting and as well as the different assays that are used. And therefore, for clinical purposes, it is always recommended that you go clinician uh, mediated uh, genetic testing where you can be sure of uh, the right uh, right interpretations made from the uh, from validated testing agencies. Uh, another important factor is which are the different types of tests, genetic tests that are available. Uh, so, like I said, there are these microarray based genetic genetic tests that are available, genotyping tests that are available, uh, where basically a set of validated variants, pharmacogenetic variants, are profiled or assayed for each sample. Uh, some of the examples for this are the DMET plus array as well as the uh, Veracode ADME core panel from Illumina. All these, these are some of the testing panels that have been adopted by different pharmacogenetics implementation studies across the world. Um, while it gives you a quick and a cost effective way of understanding the genetic status or the, the variation status of different genes that you are profiling for, for some of the cons is that it can give you false negative results because in this particular case, you are only testing some known set of variants. And therefore, if a certain variant is not included as part of this assay, then you are sure to miss it. And therefore, you could be assumed, wrongly uh, assumed to be a normal metabolizer, for example, of that particular gene. When you have a variant which was not tested for by that particular array. Uh, and also, it presents some challenges in terms of different assay designs across different platforms. And also, a very important factor, which is the copy number variation of genes, uh, assessment becomes limited when you go by the genotyping approach. Another important or upcoming approach that is favored by different uh, uh, institutions is targeted sequencing panel where next generation sequencing approaches are used to sequence a panel of genes, uh, very important pharmacogenes like the PGRN-seq panel where about 85 different genes are sequenced using next generation sequencing. Now the advantages are of course that apart from the known pharmacogenetic variants, you also get to discover novel variants. There is better copy number variation and structural variant detection here. But however, the cost tends to be higher on this platform. Now apart from this, there are also genome wide arrays that are available, uh, which look at multiple uh, hundred thousands of or millions of variants across the genome in a single assay like the global screening array from Illumina. Now, these kind of array information along with facing and imputation, basically facing and imputation allows you to understand the genetic status of variants that are not included in this array as well, uh, using uh, some a reference population information and thereby giving very comprehensive coverage of the information that you are interested in. Uh, but the cons are that, I mean, uh, it is costlier compared to the genotyping approaches moderate costs are associated with it. So uh, it, what is very important across all these different types of testing strategies that are available is to understand, to be able to understand how the pharmacogenetic results are reported under this different scenario. So now going over to reporting pharmacogenetic findings, what is important is now how can you go from a genetic testing result like as I have shown here, where there, where it is shown that in particular chromosome 3, at this particular position, there is a G becoming an A, guanine becoming an anosin, and there are two such mutations, and the genotype for this mutation in that individual is 0, 1, which means that only one copy of the individual has been affected by the variant. So there are two variants in the CYP2C19 gene in this individual. From this result, after genetic testing, how do we uh, come to a point where we are able to issue an alert saying that, okay, this particular person is possibly an intermediate metabolizer of this gene and therefore an alternative antiplatelet therapy has been recommended. Now, this 
involves a series of steps. Uh, so f as I said, what I, what you see right now there is called the genotype, as you know, which basically tells you at which particular position in the gene you have a mutation. Now from this, you need to do what you call haplotyping and then diplotyping. That is from the genetic mutation or variation data, you need to be able to tell which is that allele name or the which is that particular type of allele or the copy, the haplotype that the per, per individual has. So for example, to be able to do that, there is an important step before that, which is known as phasing. Now phasing is something that will allow you to understand if the two mutations that you are seeing there are on the same copy of the uh, individual or on two different copies since each individual has two copies of a gene and we know that two variants are there do we know can we now find out if both these variants are on the same copy or is it that each copy has one variant each now this is this can be done either experimentally or computationally using different in silico approaches and uh, for example let's assume that in this particular individual it is zero uh, 101 1, which means let's say that it is the same copy that has the both the mutations so now you know how that this individual has two copies of cyp 2 c19 gene but one of the copy has two mutations both the mutations now we just know that now from this we need to be able to assign a name for this allele is the cyp 2 c19 star 1 star 2 star 3 these are called the star allele nomenclatures for the uh, cyp 2 genes cyp genes so to be able to assign a particular allele name or a haplotype name for this particular individual you need the help of what you call allele definition tables which are again shared being made available in farm gkb and the cpic web websites there is also a, a, a database called the farm war which actually helps you uh, identify these uh, mapping so a typical allele definition table looks like this so on the four top five rows give you different information about the different mutations that are present in the gene and the first column here list down the different alleles that are known for cyp 2 c19 as you can see there are different allele numbers that you can see here and based on the specific combination of variation variations that an individual has you can assign a certain allele number for that individual in this case as i said this particular individual has the g2a at the 22973 position and the r to a to g at the 85186 position now that tells you that this this particular copy of this individual is a star 3 type now the other copy does not have any of these mutations or variations and therefore that's a star 1 which is the normal allele or the wild type allele which is the most most prevalent most commonly found phenotype uh, or the genotype for this particular gene so in so after this particular exercise we come to uh, find understand that this individual is has cyp 2 c19 star 1 star 3 so one is the star one allele and the other one is a star three allele. Now the next question is how do we now go from this to a phenotype? Can How can we say now whether he is a rapid metabolizer or an extensive metabolizer or a poor metabolizer? For this purpose you again take the help of another table called the allele functionality table again which are shared by farm gkb and cpic databases. So and the allele functionality table you again see that for each of these listed allele names the specific functional status is also listed so here you can see that star 1 has normal function whereas star 3 has no function it has zero function so therefore we now know that this individual has one normal function gene and one no function gene now we, if we need to go from here to the phenotype we use what is known as a function phenotype table therefore the specific combination of alleles that you have you can identify which is the phenotype so in our case here we have a normal allele and a no function allele which makes that person an intermediate metabolizer for that gene you can also do this in a single step by using what you call the diplotype phenotype table which will directly tell you if you are a star 1 star 3 you are an intermediate metabolizer for that gene. 
So after you get the phenotype here, now uh, the most important thing is to identify what's the clinical guideline that is there for administering, uh, you know, clopidogrel, for example. And uh, this is the clinical guideline for uh, clopidogrel, as I said, shown earlier. So in case of an intermediate metabolizer, you have you have been suggested an alternate therapy like prasugrel or tisacrero. And that now helps you finally generate an alert which tells you to uh, take an, a different medication. So this is how we go all the way from the genotype uh, data to the, uh, to the clinical decision support alerts that can be generated for this particular patient. Now, uh, as I said, there are several pharmacogenomics implementation initiatives that are, uh, that are ongoing and being completed across different parts of the world. This particular uh, figure here summarizes the efforts that are going on in about 27 different institutions across the world. Uh, they are under different uh, major project uh, headings, as you can see here. And the biggest one in the Americas is the Wright Project, the one in the Mayo Clinic and the St. Jude. You have the major European project here, which is the uh, Ubiquitous Pharmacogenetics Project, which is the UPGX project. Also, we have an effort ongoing on the Southeast Asia uh, 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 called the Sea Farm, fo uh, focused on Japan and the Southeast Asian countries. Now, uh, the, all these different initiatives are trying to implement, uh, like we said, some of these actionable uh, pharmacogenetic guidelines right into the clinic. Uh, and uh, of course, in that process, several barriers have been identified. Uh, one, of, one of the foremost thing is at the evidence level, we need to have more clinical trials to evaluate the improved safety and efficacy of pharmacogenomics guided prescriptions. There are so many studies already out there, but we definitely need more studies in every different population to be able to as a, create more evidence, generate more evidence in that regard. Obviously, we also need more studies of cost effectiveness because it is very important important to prove how this is going to be not only a clinical benefit but also more effective as, as far as cost is concerned. Now translation, of course as I said there are different challenges in terms of translation of results from the genotype to the uh, to the alert system and therefore it's very important to have a standardization of these translation which is an effort already been initiated and ongoing by the databases like FarmWare and FarmCat which is another tool that lets you uh, convert these genotypes into the final uh, recommendations, guidelines and alerts using standardized uh, methods. Also, as you can imagine, as more and more research is conducted, there will be more evidence that is being created and therefore all these online resources and guidelines need to be continually uh, updated and uh, that's a very important uh, need. And as far as testing is concerned, it's very important to validate the different assays that are available out there for clinical use to know what is included and what is not included. Otherwise, there can be a lot of uh, discrepancies in the in the interpretations, in the phenotypic interpretations that are uh, inferred out of these uh, tests. It's also very important to standardize the nomenclature that is used. You have to call intermediate metabolizer across different reporting systems. You can't have another uh, less likely, less extensive or normal versus extensive. So you have to have a standardized reporting nomenclature as well as in the clinical decision support alerts. And of course, most of most important thing is to improve the acceptance and awareness of this uh, amongst the community. Uh, main community, including the clinicians, the pharmacists, as well as the end users. It's important to spread awareness of the clinical benefit, to develop clinical decision support systems, the infrastructure around it that can help, that can make it a very seamless proceed, uh, process for the clinician to be alerted of these uh, uh, pharmacogenetic gui uh, guidelines and make appropriate action. And of course, a lot, a lot of education that is also very important uh, in this regard, uh, both for clinicians as well as for the patients. Uh, with that, I would like to take this uh, uh, discussion of today to a conclusion. Uh, and I hope uh, in this video, we have been able to appreciate some of the very important uh, elements of uh, implementing clinic uh, uh, pharmacogenetics in the clinic. And of course, uh, we should never let perfect be the enemy to being able to implement these things into the clinic. Uh, I hope you found this very helpful. Thank you.